including, uh, oh, I suppose from about around the 19th or 20th of June, uh, one which actually uh, the navigator uh, torn up the bits. Uh, I think Falcon told me that there were 3,000 pieces they had actually picked up and they sat up all night sticking them together. And these, when the bits were stuck together, actually gave, and uh, I think I have them here, the mention of the figures. And uh, it said UKW, which uh, means ultra Kurzweil and ultra short wave, and Knicke, which is obviously Knickerbein. And they then gave a position, uh, 53, 38, 7 north, 8 degrees, 56, 8 minutes west. Stolberg. This was the location of a second Knickerbein transmitter in Schleswig-Holstein. This station provided the cross beam for the one at Cleve. The bomber pilot could use the Cleve beam for direction, flying along its equisignal. Then, when near the target, the receiver would be tuned to the cross beam from Stolberg to give the range. First, he would fly through the dots to reach the constant tone of the equisignal, and when he was in the center of the cross beam, the target would be directly beneath the bomber. The massive aerials of the Knickerbein station could be swung to locate the beams over any target. The captured documents even gave the frequencies in use, 30 and 31.5 megacycles. This information was available to R.V. Jones just in time for a meeting with the Prime Minister. I said to him, well, so would it help if I told you the story from the beginning? Well, he sort of startled back a bit and said, uh, yes, that's a good idea. He said, and, of course, I then told him the story uh, from, right from the beginning of uh, how the build-up had occurred with the stories of the ex great being mentioned by prisoners and building up, of course, to all the very latest evidence. And then the discussion, of course, uh, obviously Winston was, was convinced. Uh, I could see I was making an impression, uh, obviously a very deep impression. And uh, at the end of it, uh, well, what could be done? And, well, various countermeasures could be. Uh, undertaken, putting in a false beam, for it, the first one I thought of, or, or fooling about with the dots and the dashes, uh, or even straight jamming. There were various possibilities. Winston Churchill's version of that same meeting is contained in his book, Their Finest Hour. And he writes, being master and not having to argue too much, once I was convinced about the principles of this queer and deadly game, I gave all the necessary orders that very day in June for the existence of the beams to be assumed and for all countermeasures to receive absolute priority. The slightest reluctance or deviation in carrying out this policy was to be reported to me. But of course the first thing was to be absolutely certain that they really were there and it wasn't a great hoax. I didn't think it was for a moment, but nevertheless one needed to really listen. And by this time we had in fact got a search aircraft equipped. It was Navro Anson from the blind flying unit at Boscombe Down. As it was being prepared, the French were selling the armistice in Fox railway carriage at Compiègne. While Hitler was conducting this humiliating piece of theatre, in London there was a parallel meeting which was to prove in its way just as dramatic. The radio expert, T.L. Eckersley, on whose evidence Jones was relying, was about to drop a bombshell. Arnold Wilkins from the National Physical Laboratory was present when Eckersley spoke. And I remember him saying that, in his opinion, reception at any distance on this wavelength was quite impossible, and he'd stake his reputation on this statement. Well, this is an absolute blow from my point of view, because if that really were true, of course, uh, all the fuss that I had been the cause of uh, would now be exploded. And uh, what could happen to me for the rest of my life, I don't know, was uh, very problematic. I, but I pointed out to him that I'd used one of his own papers to convince Lindemann that this showed quite clearly the beams would go that far. Hurry, so you don't want to believe that. You see, I was showing then how far they might go, but I don't really think they go as far as that. And at that point, uh, Lywood, uh, who was um, group captain, uh, principal deputy director of Signals, uh, said, well, here we have the world's expert on propagation. He says the beams are impossible. We ought not to waste any more time on it. I think we ought to cancel the flight. And faced with this, I did, I think, the only thing I could do, uh, which was to say, well, now, look, I was at a meeting in the cabinet room this morning, and I heard the Prime Minister give orders for that flight to take place. And if it doesn't take place, I shall see that he gets to know who it was who cancelled it. At that point, Leo Lywood caved in 
And uh, so they said, all right, they'd have the flight, although quite clearly, at least some of us didn't expect to find anything. So they said, well, where should we fly? The aircraft had been flown to Witten to be near the east coast, which any beam from Germany would have to cross. The Ansons were, in fact, far from ideal for this sort of search operation. They were slow, cold and extremely noisy aircraft that had already been pensioned off from operational flying. There is a record, in fact, in the archives at Boscombe Down to show that at least one of the aircraft involved in this project had been recommended for write-off by the engineers. But they were all that could be spared. It was, remember, only five days after the Dunkirk evacuation and everyone was expecting Britain to be invaded by the Germans at any moment. The aircraft had been fitted up with a special American VHF receiver known as Hallicrafters S27. They were designed essentially for radio amateurs, but they were the only receivers available in England at the time that covered the predicted frequency of the beams. And the story goes that an RAF officer was dispatched to buy up the whole stock from a radio shop in Soho on credit. The pilot was a Flight Lieutenant Bufton, a skilled beams approach pilot, and the radio operator was a Corporal Mackey of Y Service, a group of skilled operators, most of them pre-war radio hams, who had been formed into this special unit. The name of the navigator isn't known. So, on the night of the 21st of June 1940, an Anson took off from Witten. The crew hadn't been told any of the details of the Nicobine story. They'd simply been ordered to search for radio transmissions with the Lorentz characteristics, series of dots and dashes. And if they found any, to try to locate the bearing of the equisignal in the centre of the beam. So, Flight Lieutenant Bufton climbed away from Witten on a northerly heading in the darkness and the heavy cloud. Behind him, Corporal Mackey at the receiver was carefully searching around 31.5 megacycles. But all he could hear was the crash of the static. Then, when they were very close to Spalding, faintly at first, but steadily growing clearer through the noise, the unmistakable sound of a series of Morse dots. And Mackey called out to the pilot, Skipper, listen to those dots. I think I found the signal. And as they listened, the dots, now very loud, became a constant note, the equisignal in the middle of the beam. And as they continued on their northerly heading, that equisignal became a series of dashes. They had, without doubt, found the secret beam. And when the navigator plotted the bearing, it turned out to be 104284 degrees from true north. The equisignal was just 400 yards wide. The frequency was exactly 31.5 megacycles. And on the charts, that beam passed directly over the critical Rolls-Royce Aero Engine Factory at Derby. This was the only factory at that time making the Rolls-Royce Merlin engines that powered the vital Spitfires and Hurricanes for the soon-to-be-fought Battle of Britain. That same night, the searching Anson found the second beam from Stolberg. It confirmed all that Jones had feared. Well, of course, one of the things I did after this uh, was to write an account of the story so far uh, under the title The Crooked Leg, uh, but um, I couldn't resist the opportunity of ending the report, having summarised all the intelligence and with the sentence, uh, if our good fortunes hold, we may yet pull the crooked leg. The first thing that was to be done was to set up some sort of jamming, even if it was just crude radio interference, since that could be effective over a short distance. In any case, it would certainly be better than nothing, because once an aircraft had lost the signals, it could be difficult on a dark night to get back on the beam. The operational jamming of Nicobine was the concern of an RAF signals officer, Wing Commander E.B. Addison, who was soon to be in charge of the first radio countermeasures unit, 80 wing of the RAF, which was installed initially in a garage near Garston at Watford. Somebody came up with the idea that we had got transmitters in the country more or less on the same frequency as the Knickerbine in the 30 megacycles range. And these were the diathermy sets that were used by the medical people in hospital for various work in their surgeries. A doctor who came to see me and said he knew all about diathermy sets, could he help me? I said, yes, you can. Go out and change your, your mufti suit for, for a uniform. The next day he came along from Mossbrus with a brand new flight attendant uniform.